if I have a thought in my mind, all right, and then I write it on a piece of paper, it was stored in interconnected pathways in my brain. Now it's written down on a piece of paper. Now I take that paper and I type it into my computer. It goes into a flash memory. It goes actually in, into SRAM right away. And then when I hit save, it goes into, uh, into flash memory. Now I take this and I upload it to the cloud. So it goes through an RF wave to the, to the box on the wall, wherever that is, and, and it'll, it'll go into that box just through an RF wave. So that information has been here, it's been on a piece of paper, it's been on SRAM, it's, it's been on flash memory, now it's in an RF wave. Then when it hits that box, it goes down a wire, that information is going down a wire, then it goes through a server farm into another flash memory. The matter upon which it resides is secondary. The information is primary. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a God Science. Mi nombre es Cristian Jiménez y en esta ocasión les traigo un video que es una compilación de tres extractos que hablan sobre un tema muy importante en la actualidad que es tema de debate, que es el origen de la información especificada, un concepto, una idea tan intrigante en la comunidad científica filosófica y por supuesto entre el tema o sobre la existencia de Dios y es que en estos videos van a ver cómo se presenta este enigma sobre el origen de la información. Sabemos que la información y los números y las matemáticas, el lenguaje, las letras son objetos inmateriales, ¿verdad? Son objetos abstractos, son objetos que no son físicos, mas sin embargo estos conceptos terminan gobernando nuestra realidad tangible Y esta discusión no solamente abre un rompecabezas científico, sino también que nos lleva a una profunda indagación filosófica. ¿Podría ser, es la pregunta, que detrás de todo lo tangible exista un nivel más profundo e inmaterial que finalmente lo rige? Este es un video que realmente los va a invitar a la reflexión y al debate. We are in the information age. Information is usually carried on material. Information is not material. It's immaterial. Now here's a this, wonderful thing. This is another huge idea. It is. Information is immaterial. Yes. So if all you believe in is the material universe, information itself doesn't it make sense. It does make sense, yes, absolutely. But you'll have to explain how information <clears throat> is immaterial. Well, suppose I want to carry a message. I'm sitting on top of a mountain in Washington State, my favorite mountain up there with the snow on it. You know that mountain? I do. And I'm Rain, sitting on Rainier. the radiator. So I, I make smoke signals, and up they go into the air, and they're seen by some Indians 20 miles away. But they're more intelligent than me, so they've got a telephone. So they pick up the telephone, and they convey the information to somebody else who, uh, types it on the internet and it's received in Oxford. The information that's received in Oxford is not material. Material things have been used to get it there, but it itself is not material. <laughs> and this gives people great difficulty. But is the idea behind that if my eyes read letters on a wall, I'm reading a sign. Yes. The letters on the sign are material. Yes. I am material. Yes. But what I gather from the letters the is, concept not, is, not, is material. not reducible on any level to the material. No. Uh, in other words, it's not as if something has been beamed into my brain. Mm -hmm. My eyes can look at the shapes, but turning it into information is somehow Immaterial. Let me illustrate this with what actually has happened to me several times. I'm sitting at dinner, and we have lovely dinners at Oxford, you know, in our college, and the seat placings are fixed. And one night, I found myself beside a very eminent biochemist. And unfortunately, he asked me what I did. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. And he said, how dreadfully boring. And he meant it. He meant it. He said that. Yes, he said that. How dreadfully boring. And uh, I saw that this was going to be a bit of a, a social disaster. So I said, but don't worry about that. I know my subject is quite unsociable and complicated. So I tried to make up for that by being interested in the big questions. He said, what big questions? Well, I said, like, the status of the universe. Is it created or not? He said, stop, it's far worse than I thought. He said, listen, I'm an atheist, I'm a reductionist, and we have nothing to talk about, and we're going to have a miserable dinner. 
Well, that was a challenge for an Irishman. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, I with a great grin, because I grin, you know, when I'm panicking. I, a great grin, I say to him, no, we're going to have a marvelously interesting evening. He said, why is that? Well, I said, I'm fascinated by reductionism. I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? <laughs> well, that was a bit difficult. So I helped him out because I'm also quite a kind, friendly Irishman. Well, you're very generous. So I said to him, look, you got a problem. I got a problem. You and biochemistry, me and mathematics, we split it up into little problems. Try and solve them. Get insight on the big problem. He said, I do that. I said, I do that. That's methodological reductionism. I said, we both do that. So we have something to talk about. But he said, I'm not that kind of reductionism, a reductionist. I said, I know you're not. You are an ontological reductionist. Ontos, Greek for being. You believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, exactly. And that's why we have nothing to talk about. I said, we have. Why don't we do an experiment? He said, what? I said, you heard me. Why don't we do an experiment? <laughs> But he says, this is dinner. I said, yes, but it's Oxford. <laughs> and he said, watch the experiment. I picked up the menu. And he said, what's the problem with the menu? Roast chicken. I said, that's the problem for you, not for me. He said, why? I said, R-O-A-S-T. Those are marks on paper. Yes, they are, but they say roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, I've learned English. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. You've learned English, and you give those marks a meaning, and you're a reductionist, everything physics and chemistry. I said, OK, you explain to me how those marks convey the idea of roast chicken and just use the material of the paper and ink. Dead silence. This is a deep, this is maybe not for you. <laughs> but for most of us, this is a very uh, deep, or as we say, heavy idea. Is the ancient philosophical problem of the one and the many. Hmm. That is to say, what is the underlying unity of these three seemingly disparate realms of reality, the mental, the abstract, and the physical? Um, these realms of reality are so different, so causally unconnected, it seems, that one wonders what is the underlying unity for mm. all of these. So how are these three realms related? For example, the mathematical abstract realm cannot be the source of the physical or conscious mental realm because abstract objects, by definition, are causally a feat. That's part of what it means to be an abstract object, the number seven for example, has no effect upon anything. Mm. So the abstract realm cannot provide the source of unity. Could it be the physical realm that provides the source? Well, Rogers already mentioned the second mystery. How does the physical give rise to consciousness, particularly mm. intentionality? The intentionality is the aboutness of our mental states. I can think about my summer vacation. No physical object has intentionality. Mm. So the mental is difficult to derive from the physical, and the abstract, it seems to me, is impossible mm. because the mathematical realm is characterized by necessity. These are logically necessary truths, and by its plenitude. There are infinite realms of mathematical objects. And the physical realm, by contrast, is contingent uh, and therefore cannot ground these logical and mathematical truths, and it's plausibly finite as well. So the physical can't be mm. the support. Now, what about the mental? Could the mental be the source of these other two realms? Well, in mental causation, we do have the experience of the mental causing physical changes hmm. in our brain. I can will to get up hmm. uh, or to speak. Um, similarly, many philosophers have thought that the abstract realm is not really a separate realm that exists by itself, but it, 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 they are ideas in the mind of, uh, of consciousness hmm. that they uh, are the, the result of intellection hmm. by a mind. 
Now, the problem is that no human mind could be the source of the abstract realm because of its plenitude and necessity, whereas we are contingent and finite. So what I want to invite Roger <laughs> to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? That is to say, an omniscient mind which has created the physical realm and which is the source of the abstract mathematical realm. This would solve the problem of the one and the many and give you an underlying unity for this um, tripartite metaphysic that you affirm. And, and what you've just described sounds suspiciously like God, uh, Bill. <laughs> yes, but, uh, it, it did sound suspiciously <laughs> like that, yes. Roger, what do you say? But the question is, what is the origin of the information? Origin of information. Critical for life is the origin of information, DNA and RNA, the order in which these things are attached. This information is primary, matter is secondary. Matter is secondary. So if I have a thought in my mind, all right, and then I write it on a piece of paper, it was stored in interconnect pathways in my brain. Now it's written down on a piece of paper. Now I take that paper and I type it into my computer. It goes into a flash memory. It goes actually in, into SRAM right away. And then when I hit save, it goes into, uh, uh, into flash memory. Now I take this and I upload it to the cloud. So it goes through an RF wave to the, to the box on the wall, wherever that is, and, and it'll, it'll go into that box just through an RF wave. So that information has been here, it's been on a piece of paper, it's been on SRAM, it's, it's been on flash memory, now it's in an RF wave. Then when it hits that box, it goes down a wire, that information is going down a wire, then it goes through a server farm into another flash memory. The matter upon which it resides is secondary. The information is primary. The information is the key. Nobody knows where this informational code came from. If somebody tells you that the DNA itself is the code, that's a bunch of garbage. That's like saying this, this, this memory stick. You know, I just bought it, this memory, I have a memory stick in my pocket. So this memory stick, this is the information. <laughs> uh, I haven't written anything on it, but that's inherently the information. No, this is the medium upon which it's stored. Where did the blueprint come from? Where did this specified information come from? 